Very exciting time of year this weekend. The Duke softball program opens up the NCAA Super Regionals. They've got a big-time series and matchup with UCLA. Joining me on today's show, Tara Henry from D1 Softball joins our conversation to preview all things Duke and UCLA coming up on today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson, the host of the show. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore and follow our show on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. On this Friday edition of Lockdown Blue Devils, we want to let you know that our show is brought to you by Bet Online. Today's episode being brought to you by Bet Online. Haven't you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before? Bet Online, where the game starts. On today's program, Tara Henry from D1 Softball joins the show, a former standout softball player herself and 2004 national champion with the UCLA Bruins, gives us the rundown on the NCAA Super Regionals for Duke and UCLA. We'll now bring her on to today's program. Tara, I certainly do appreciate the time. I know it's a busy week for you getting ready for all these Super Regional matchups. Thanks for joining the show. Uh, thank you, JJ. Uh, pleasure to join you and Always excited to talk all things Division One softball. Yeah, so let's get to it. I, I want to start big picture for where we're at in the sport. I mean, it's a sport that's growing. You see reports out there that in terms of viewership and revenue, the last decade for softball has been astronomical. You can combine football and baseball, and you wouldn't get to the levels that softball has been at. How awesome has that been to see as a former softball player yourself and now the work that you do? You know, back in the day, there were just maybe a regional televised, maybe one out of 16. Uh, and really back in the day, it wasn't even on uh, television or streaming. So to see the growth in our sport, not only to be able to view every single regional, every single game, over 100 games, just you're able to watch them as a viewer. Not only that, but just the parity across the sport and you know, you're seeing different names uh, reaching the Supers, and it's not just the Arizonas and the UCLA's and the Oklahoma's. Uh, we're seeing a, a huge growth in our sport. And, you know, I don't like to say mid-majors because I, I don't even think that we can even cap, uh, categorize some of these teams as uh, typical mid-majors. I just think um, across the board, the level of play is outstanding. And, and our sport, uh, you see it on television, and it's just exciting and fun to watch. The number now in 2022, there are currently 286 Division I softball programs, and I'm sure many schools are going to see that change and, and add D1 softball to their athletic program and that sort of thing. Is it simply television viewership? Is that the biggest reason that we've seen this jump, or is there something else too? I think there, that's a big portion of it. If you can see it, you can be it, and I think – young girls are able to see their heroes on television every week. And that's just, that's just the facts. I mean, as a young girl, as a young softball player, you're able to, to dream and, and want to be a Jocelyn Aloe or a Montana Fouts or, or, you know, a Deja Davis. Like I think it's, it's an incredible platform and not only is softball the grassest growing sport, fastest growing sport, I believe it's one of the most exciting and how can you not love watching a softball game uh, on television or, or even just sitting at a bar or at home, whatever that is. I tell people all the time that the number of games I've done uh, in my career from the play-by-play -play seat for both the ACC network and the SEC network, their digital shows for baseball and softball, I'm choosing softball all the time because of the pace of play, the speed, how quick games go. And it just feels like oftentimes you see really good offense and there's good pitching that goes along with it hand in hand. It's a sport that I certainly love watching so much. Has the sport changed at all from the performance on the field since you've played? Yes, I think it has. 
you used to see more pitchers duels. I don't think we had the metrics or the technology back in the day into in terms of uh, ability to identify pitches for scouting purposes. We didn't have a ton of videos. So you weren't able to really watch uh, an opposing pitcher before you actually got to step into the box. So yes, I think it's become a more offensive game, the technology not only in available uh, film, but also in the bats. Uh, I mean, balls are flying out of the yard and and who doesn't love a, a good slugfest? Uh, I, I love that about our game. But I also, there's a part of me that that loves a good pitcher's duel. So do I think it's changed? Yes, uh, a significant amount. And I think that has to do with technology. And, and again, you can attest to this, even the ACC network, uh, having the ACC network, you'd argue that that helped propel the the entire conference and into what it is today and have uh, three in the supers. Are you kidding me? Like if you would have told me that back in the day, uh, I would have said you're crazy. But to have that exposure for kids to know that they can go to these schools, I think it's been a huge leap. It's certainly great to see the ACC growing. You mentioned the number of teams they've got in the super regionals. You go back a decade ago, two decades you wouldn't see that many teams playing the sport, period, and now they've reached uh, just one foot away, the last step before you can get to the Women's College World Series. I want to get to the Duke and UCLA Series in just a moment, and obviously you had such a standout career for the UCLA Bruins. When you look back on your career, what are you most proud of? You know, I, I think we tend to focus on the wins and losses in the national championships, but I'd argue that the greatest thing about being a UCLA Bruin is the alumni, the sisterhood of being having some of my best friends come out, come out of, uh, you know, being a, a Bruin. And I'd argue it's, it's the strongest alumni network across the country. I don't talk about it a lot because, uh, you know, I cover the sport now, but just uh, playing under Sue Inquist, le legendary head coach Sue Inquist, just the life lessons that you learn, accountability, um, the ability to to work as a team, to 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 be with around a group of people that aren't necessarily like you, but to, to go for a common goal. And again, I'll remember, you know, the bus rides and the plane rides and playing Uno in the in the airport, that stuff. I mean, obviously the national championship was was a big deal in 2004, but uh, the friendships made a, a, across those four years are something that I treasure and and will never um, forget. So catch us up to speed. Obviously, people know about the the play on the field for Tara Henry. How do you make the transition into the media space and what you're doing now? How did that come to be? Oh gosh, it's, a, it's such a long story, but I'll keep it quite short. Uh, I, after softball, I actually went into real estate, and I was in real estate for a while. But I missed the sport. I loved it. I I, I traveled internationally uh, and was doing some work uh, on the international softball level with the WBSC and the European Softball Federation. Uh, and then decided I'd lived it over in Europe. Uh, I was going to move home, and and this kind of just kind of fell into my lap. And they said, "Hey, uh, we're going to start this site, D1 Softball, and it's going to be the sister site to D1 Baseball." And you know, D1 Baseball was such a rich history. Uh, I said, "Yeah, I'm in with Kendall Rogers." And, and Kyle Peterson and so we've kind of grown this this site from what it was to what it is now and and it's just been incredible to tell the stories of the players and highlight great performances and be able to give the sport of softball and the athletes uh, the recognition that they truly deserve and and it's just been a pleasure to be able to do that and I feel really lucky and really fortunate to be able to get paid to to watch softball and then talk and write about it yeah it, no, no kidding <laughs> It, it doesn't get better than that, that's for sure. And, and D1 softball has become the authority on all things that you go with the sport each and every week. I know the teams that I'm around are always curious, where are we going to be in the D1 softball top 25? What adjustments have we made over the past week and that sort of thing? So uh, in just a moment, I want to talk a little bit more about this Duke program, the rise that they have, and we'll get into a super regional appearance. Tara Henry from D1 softball joining me on today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils. Bet Online, our proud sponsor of today's edition of the podcast. Bet Online has you covered, and it continues to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. You can find all of the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's NBA playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL future odds. Bet Online continues to be your source for all the sporting wagering information that you need. From live betting to playoffs, esports, and more, you can head to the website today or use your mobile device. To learn more about the trends in action, bet online where the game starts.
As we welcome you back into today's edition of Lockdown Blue Devils, J.J. Jackson alongside Tara Henry from D1 Softball. All right, let's talk about the Stoop program. That's what people want to hear on this podcast. And to think about the rise that this program has had, I'll throw out the numbers to you, and you kind of tell me how in the world this all came to be. But Marissa Young is hired in 2015 to field a team that's not going to play until 2018. And they've only played five or six seasons, and now here they are advancing to the Super Regionals. How in the world does the school do that? You know, it's quite incredible. I think that the programs, uh, not only Duke, but Clemson, same kind of deal. To have the success that early in a program's existence is just, it's a testament to Mercy Young and her staff and, and what they've been able to do there at Duke. And I, I believe that comes with obviously recruiting great talent, but then you can always have great talent, but it's what you do with it and how you put those pieces together. And I think that's why Marissa Young has been so successful. She's been able to put together an incredible pitching staff, at even losing the ace in, in the beginning of the season. Uh, and, and Shelby Walters uh, pivoting and, and seeing the rise of Peyton St. George and Jayla Wright. It's just, and then you got to look at the offense. I mean, there's so many pieces to, to put it all together, but just an incredible job for we look at just the contrast between UCLA and Duke, UCLA, a storied program that, that's been around for decades. Uh, and then you got Duke, a, a five year program. So I, I really am excited about this matchup and I'm going to be there live in person. So I'm even more excited about it. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll have thoughts throughout the weekend that I definitely want people to check out. If you're watching us on YouTube here today, you see the Twitter handle there at no terrible days. I love the pun that you've got there uh, for folks listening to us on audio. Check out the video feed so you can see that for yourself. Uh, so this Duke softball program last season, they win the ACC championship. They get to host a regional and Georgia is in the regional with them as well. But Duke wasn't able to actually host the regional one of those weird softball scenarios where we had a Durham regional in Athens, Georgia, where Duke's the one seed but playing away from home. The fact that they were able to play the Bulldogs once again and knock down the door was just so cool for me to see. What would you think of that as well? You know, I agree. And and we were watching this because, like you said, JJ, having Duke as the seed but Georgia hosting last year and then the, the Bulldogs eventually getting to the World Series, I wouldn't have – thought that was going to happen yeah. but it did but you know dropping that game six which was the first game against Georgia uh, I mean I was watching both games really intently and I'm like oh, I'm thinking I'm sitting there I'm going oh, this is going to be another great matchup and who's going to edge this one out but again I think Jayla Wright's performance in that and that second game those three innings she she had an incredible uh Sunday for Duke uh, and then just timely hitting just that offense when you've got seven hitters hitting over 300 and if you look at the slugging of the OPS plus slugging percentage for the blue the 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 blue devils you're thinking holy cow this team can hit <laughs> i mean and you got Christina Foreman on that offense and i just think you know Marissa Young we talked about this they've done an incredible job there and get out of that regional and, and get some revenge against that Georgia squad that um you know, had knocked them out last year and just an exciting series and one I really enjoyed watching. In a lot of ways, you think it would be difficult to go into the Sunday knowing that you've got the advantage, right? That you've got to be beat twice in one day. You feel good about the odds. It's, in, it's not impossible, however, as we saw Florida State, who's been the flag bearer for ACC softball, get defeated twice by Mississippi State this past Sunday. But you're right, for Duke to be down 5-1, in game seven, having just lost the other game for Jayla Wright to come in and kind of calm everything down for Duke. You could say a lot about the offense and 12 unanswered runs to win in a run rule fashion, but at some point, someone's got to come in and start throwing strikes and getting out. Yeah, and, and Jayla Wright just did that. She kind of, we, what we say, we stopped the bleeding a little bit. You know, when, she, she just is so calm in there. And what I really, really like about Wright is, she just keeps the ball in the yard. She doesn't give up home runs. She doesn't give up the long ball, which is what Georgia is known for. I mean, if you look at it, she, in comparison to Peyton St. George, she keeps the ball down. She be, keeps the ball down in the zone. And I do think that that was a big reason that she was successful against the Georgia Bulldogs, who historically we know 
uh, just literally they mash and we all know that <laughs> they, they mash. So uh, I am, I can't say enough about her performance and, and what she was able to do uh, to help advance Duke advance to the supers. Yeah. So we've set the stage. It's now Duke. It's UCLA. The winner gets to go to the women's college world series. It's a national blue blood in the sport and the UCLA Bruins. And it's a new school that's had a lot of athletic success in other sports, but now softball gets a chance to shine in the Super Regionals, and it's going to be a fun series. We'll get our final preview coming up in just one moment after our final timeout here on today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils. Thank you for making Locked On Blue Devils your first listen and your first watch every single day. For your next listen, make sure you check out Locked On Sports Today podcast. It's the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Locked On Sports Today is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome you back into today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils on this Friday, later tonight, 11 p.m. Eastern time. Really late start for folks for Duke and UCLA here on the East Coast. Tara, you mentioned you're going to be there a little bit later. So uh, we know the Duke perspective. Give us a preview about UCLA because, again, I could give the numbers all day long talking about six straight Women's College World Series appearances, 13 national championships for the Bruins and the sport. Uh, but what really stands out about this year's UCLA Bruins team? You know, the biggest question mark, I think, for the Bruins entering the season was Megan Faramo, her health, because obviously she'd missed the Women's College World Series last year. And then if Holly Acevedo was going to step up in the circle and, and be a great compliment to Faramo, both of those things happened in the circle. And I'd argue that the Bruins have one of the top, the toughest pitching staffs in the country. I think it's it's a tough tough thing to go into Easton and um, face both Faramo and Holly Acevedo. Uh, then you got to look at the offense. You know, to be honest, the Bruins went through a little bit of an offensive skid in, in the pa in Pac-12 play, and I'll say that they've they've come out of that. And you've got to look at Delaney Wiz. She's leading the offense for the Bruins. She was an LMU transfer. Her her sister was at UCLA just a couple years back, and she has just performed at the plate, especially with runners in scoring position. So big bat in Delaney Wiz. You got Brianna Perez, the the shortstop there. Again, incredible leader for the Bruins, and and it's has really actually broken and set all kinds of records at, at UCLA. Uh, so so keep an eye on her defense, and then of course you got Maya Brady in center field. Uh, she leads the lead or she leads the team in home runs, uh, and is the captain out there in the outfield. But you know, heading Duke heading into Los Angeles, I would say, you know, we talk about walking into Easton Stadium. You've got the history. You'll see the, the history of the sport, all the All Americans, the various Olympians. I don't think the Blue Devils are going to be a, a team that's kind of. A, you know, intimidated by that. I don't get that from, from Duke. And I think Marissa Young is a part of that. And I think they'll go in there and be able to try and, and face a really tough UCLA team. And, and, you know, it's anybody's game. I don't think that UCLA is a, a lock, but uh, by any means. And, and I think it's going to be a great series to not only to watch, but I'm just, again, I'm excited that I could just see it in person. You got to be able to take it all in one day at a time, live in the moment would kind of be the message, I reckon, to this Duke team as they get set for the big stage. A lot of eyeballs on this Duke softball program that, again, is just so young. First season competing was 2018. You win an ACC championship last season, go to the regionals, and for the first time here in 2022, the program's going to a super regional. So from the matchup perspective, Duke-UCLA, you mentioned the great pitching that the Bruins have. The fact that they really don't let you score a whole lot of runs second in the nation and runs allowed per game. What what does stand out? Like what's the big softball perspective on this matchup in particular? Again, I think it's going to come down to eliminating errors on defense. So whoever's putting the ball in play, I think eliminating uh, mistakes, eliminating an inning with four outs on both sides of the ball. Again, they do have an incredible pitching staff, the Bruins, but also Megan Framo, she's susceptible as same as Peyton St. George uh, as, as giving up the long ball. So I think it's a pretty comparable matchup. And again, the Bruins have six hitting over 300, same type of numbers in terms of the offense, but it's going to come down to great pitching, timely hitting and minimizing errors on defense. And, and that's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple formula. And whether or not Duke walks into Easton stadium, you know, it's on sets at Boulevard. 
So you're driving up Sunset Boulevard, you park, you know, you, you, Bel Air is just across the way. You're, you've seen like billion dollar homes uh, to whether they're I impacted by those lights. And again, all the national championships are up on the wall. You'll see them on, on, on the screen. It, it, you see all the national championships. So whether they can stay composed and, and be the Duke team that we've seen all season long, I think that's the biggest question mark. But again, I do think it's a fairly even matchup. And I do think it's one that uh, we'll, we'll enjoy across the country. What's the message from the UCLA perspective? Because it is so interesting that you've got this Duke team that's never been on this stage before. And just visually, when you see Hollywood, you know, but California the way it is, and then also just the program itself with all the All-Americans, 13 national championships, the great players that are being honored there at Easton Stadium. For UCLA, having been to six straight Women's College World Series, they've been there, done that. But is there a level of, uh, complacency that you have to worry about setting in or kind of what is that mindset then from the UCLA perspective for a series like this? You know, I think so. But in terms of UCLA, in terms of, of that perspective, I think they're a little bit hungry. And I think last year they left Oklahoma City with a pretty sour taste in their mouth. Uh, you know, that was a perfect game. Montana Fouts threw a perfect game and that offense was completely shut down. So I think they're they're hungry. I think they're locked in. I think they're ready to go. And again, it's one day at a time for both sides a and one swing at a time, one out at a time and not getting too kind of caught up in what they're doing. But again, you're right. I think you've got a team that that's been to OKC. You've got players that have been there for four or five years that that have that experience. And you can't there's not there's nothing you can really combat that because they've been there and they've done that. But you're right. That sense of complacency is something that I believe they work on. And and we'll see. I think we'll find out game one uh, how they come out if they come out flat. I think that's a, a good indication if UCLA is in it or not. Yeah, that, as any good series, game one always sets the tone. You look at this matchup again, Duke and UCLA. Odds makers, I'm sure, would be favoring the Bruins given the experience that they have, the great season that they've had as well. But look, it comes down to uh, 21 outs every single night in a big series like this, and, and we'll certainly see what happens there. So Tara Henry here from D1 Softball. Check out d1softball.com for all their coverage. Duke and UCLA is not the only Super Regional taking place this weekend. So I guess on our way out here, Tara, if you were to highlight another series or two that's yeah. really piquing your interest, what would it be? You know, I've got my eye on Blacksburg. I think Florida, Virginia Tech is going to be one to watch. Uh, you know, the Hokies have had an incredible season. Mm -hmm. And you'd argue the last kind of weeks had been a little bit grueling for them. And, and they've been laboring a bit. But they're there. And they made that super. So I keep my eye on Blacksburg. And then I'll give you two more. A Tempe, I think, is going to be an interesting one. I think uh, it is Daniel Williams going to be able to shut down a Sun Devils offense that has just been lights out all year long. And, and then Oregon State and Stanford, a Pac-12 matchup, and, and two unseeded teams. An unseeded team is going to for sure make it to the Women's College World Series. So Alana Vodder uh, and Reagan Krause, uh, the Stanford Cardinal, they shut down. Uh, an Alabama Crimson Tide team that had never been shut out in in postseason play and had never not made uh, advanced uh, out of their uh, super. So I, I I'm I've got my eye on those two. I mean, all are going to be great matchup, but but those are the ones I've got my eyes on. Come Monday, we're certainly going to know what the Women's College World Series field looks like, and uh, we'll see who wins all these great Super Regional matchups. Tara, I can't say thank you enough for coming on the podcast today and being on YouTube here with us for Locked On Blue Devils. Tell us one more time, give a quick plug for D1 Softball and how people can get their softball fix for the fastest growing sport. Yeah, head on over to d1softball.com. We've got scores. We've got a live scoreboard, which is unique, so you can follow all the games across the country. Uh, we've got regional previews. We had all these regional previews, and we'll have super regional previews for every single super. You'll be able to go in and just kind of get a breakdown of, of lineups, of, of teams, of storylines. Uh, we've got weekly podcasts, and uh, just really thankful that we can cover this incredible sport of softball. Incredible writers in Graham Hayes, uh, Rhiannon Podkey, and Brady Vernon. We've all got you covered throughout uh, the entire postseason, and hopefully we'll see you all in uh, OKC at uh, the Women's World College World Series. Perfect. We'll be following along for sure. Again, thank you so much for the stopping uh, by on here on the podcast. Thanks so much, JJ.
That's Tara Henry joining us here on today's show, and that's going to wrap up our program here today. We'll be back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening. As always, thank you and good day.